Okay, we'll start with some uh, introductions this morning. Good morning, my name is Ken Rimple. Uh, I work with Chariot Solutions and I'm one of the uh, members of the committee for Philly Emerging Technologies for the Enterprise 2021. We are in day two of our three-day conference and we really appreciate you coming back uh, and being here today for our keynote with Amber Case and for the rest of the content. Just a couple things. Uh, certainly we're delighted in the attendance and enthusiasm and discussion around ETE this year. It's been fantastic. Uh, discussion is really taking place the most in our Slack site. Uh, so we'll put a note in maybe a couple times, Be Be Becca, if it's okay for you, in the chat of Slack in case you haven't gotten your uh, invite or you can't find your invite to the Slack channel. I'm sorry, of, of Zoom, I should say. So check your Zoom chat if you don't have an invite yet. Uh, we added a keynote channel. Um, and so you'll actually have to uh, search for it. Um, if you go to like the announcements room, you can click on pound keynote or search for keynote and join it. And so if you want to ask questions uh, during Amber's talk, uh, you can use the keynote channel for that. You could use uh, Zoom as well if you're not able to get on Slack for whatever reason. Uh, it's good to put it on Slack just because then it's archived for later as well. For the rest of the conference, we have rooms A, B, and C, and you can basically look at the first, second, and third talks in the schedule, and that's where those rooms uh, are going to be uh, used. And you'll see in each of the rooms, it'll mention which one is uh, uh, being used for that particular purpose, what talk will be in the room. Videos will be available soon. Uh, I know there was a, a question about that in the support channel. Uh, we're shooting for some time in the next week or two. So just, you know, realistically, they'll be there and they'll be available to you uh, all the way till, uh, till, till July 31st. And then after that, we'll publish them uh, to the wider group uh, in the internet. If you want to tweet or talk about us on social media, uh, we use the pound sign Philly ETE hashtag. So feel free to do that. Um, and so with that, uh, again, Thank you for attending and let's talk about our keynote today. So Amber Case is our, our speaker. Um, pleased to introduce her. She's an internationally recognized design advocate and speaker. Uh, she's the author of four books, including one on calm technology, which is what this talk is about today. Uh, it follows the concept from a paper from Xerox Park in 1995 of smoothly capturing user attention only when necessary uh, and otherwise remaining in the background. Her other books include a kid's book on technology, and she has a notable TED talk, We Are All Cyborgs Now, uh, that now, what is it, over 2 million views now, Amber? Yeah, Great. something like that. Great talk. All right, so I will get out of the way, and thank you very much for being our speaker. Uh, I'd like to introduce Amber Case. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Amber Case, and I'm going to talk with you about designing calm technology today. Uh, I am currently a research fellow at the Mozilla Foundation studying web economics and alternatives to advertising. Um, and along the way, uh, I have been using some of my calm technology work there. So um, as an intro to calm technology, uh, I noticed that there were all these conferences, especially starting in like 2014, 2016, um, where everyone said there's going to be 20 billion devices online by, by 2020. And it, at that time, it, it was a pretty intense um, metric. And I've looked and it seems like there are a lot of statistics that say that we have this many billion devices, that suddenly the number of devices on the planet outnumber the people on the planet. And Usually in these conferences, people would talk about this as if it were the best thing in the world. At some point, we'll have all these devices. They will do things on our behalf. Uh, our life will be automated in some way uh, or we'll have more time. And so when I see these quotes and these ideas, I like to ask, does this actually sound good? Uh, let's consider different ways that this could go wrong or right. Let's consider some of, of the future. So some of us have these smart watches. Uh, when they first came out, they would just replicate what was on your phone. And so in addition to looking at your phone, when it buzzed, you would have this watch that would tell you information. Uh, if you cut down on those alerts, sometimes it gets a lot easier, uh, but a lot of people found themselves quickly overwhelmed by yet another device in their life. But when you try to put smart chips into everything, you end up with things like the smart fridge. And I've done a lot of technology consulting and a lot of clients have wanted, at least for a couple of years, this smart fridge. And when I asked them the features that they would like in their smart fridge, they would say things like, oh yes, we would like to uh, have the fridge let you know when there's not enough milk anymore so that you can get it on the way to the store. And I said, isn't that the, the basic human tenant that you would go and get milk at the store? Do you need a, a $2 million venture backed fridge startup to tell you when to buy milk at the store? Like, isn't that something that 
that we know how to do as humans. Uh, and then I had one client that said, I, I, want, um, I want to know whether the bananas have gone bad. And I said, and you're going to use what? And they said, well, we'll have a, a machine vision algorithm and a machine learning algorithm. And then it will notice the color change of the bananas. And then it will tell you if they've gone bad. And I said, look, first, people don't usually store bananas in their fridge. So that would be very difficult. Uh, but secondly, the banana has a pill. The, the, the outside of the banana tells you when it's gone bad. Why do you need this, this expensive machine vision to, to understand this? And so a lot of the, the just making something smart for no good reason was starting to come out. And also we were having trouble uh, with the idea of suddenly the, the company runs out of money and you have not a smart device, but a dumb device that, that doesn't do anything anymore and you're locked out from it. Uh, and so I created this graphic of the dystopian kitchen of the future in which everything is shouting at you. It's all speaking a different programming language. It all has a different update cycle and it takes more bandwidth than streaming something off of Netflix at your house. And so your, your, your kitchen becomes very, very talkative. And one of the issues with that is just think about selling your house or like if you got a divorce, how you would, how you would have to redo all of the settings for something that should just be really standard, like you open the fridge and you get something. So I started thinking about time and the Greeks have these two concepts of time. And one of them is chronos time, the kind of industrial time where we wake up and we have a meeting at 9 a.m. and it goes from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. It's this very specific scheduled time on a clock. But then there's this other kind of time that's very special, human time. Uh, Kairos time is what the Greeks called it. It's the time of like falling in love or watching a baby's first steps or watching a sunset. It's the time where you get into a state of flow and forget the concept of time altogether. And I thought, isn't the future of technology or the promise of technology originally to give us more human time, to get out of the way and let us live our lives? And I thought a lot of these new technologies that are coming out are forcing us constantly into Kronos time, this industrial time with all of their alerts. So there has to be some kind of technological framework that we can use and some design framework to get some of our time back and to get technology as more of a tool instead of using us. So we have this era of interruptive technology in which the power goes out and then uh, if it's it's a, if it's very smart lights, you know your lights might not work anymore. Um, or there's all these different things that could go wrong. You could go into a tunnel and suddenly like your phone doesn't work anymore. Or or more importantly, maybe your streaming music doesn't work anymore. But also it's just interrupting you constantly. And you kind of have these phones now, and they cry, and you have to pick them up and soothe them back to sleep. And they get hungry, and you have to plug them into the wall and make sure that they're fed. Sometimes people are taking care of their technology better than they're taking care of themselves. And so we need a kind of calm technology. And this concept is not new. It actually came from Xerox Park in the 80s and 90s. Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown started writing a collection of papers. They didn't have the iPad. They didn't have any of these things at that point. But what they did know is that they were kind of creating um, a future there. And they said, what, what would happen if the whole world had this future that we were predicting that we were working on? And they started to write these papers. And this paper, I really encourage people to read. It's called The Coming Age of Calm Technology. It is written just like reading a paper today. It's so clear. It's so classic. Um, and I started thinking about technology universals. We think that technology changes so much, but in reality, we stay the same. We, we still need these human universals like, like love and connection and belonging. Um, but what if technology didn't change that much either? That no matter what new technology that we make, it still kind of falls under these same principles. And so this paper is really, I found this in, in college when I was writing my thesis on mobile phones when, when the iPhone came out in 2007. And I thought it was very interesting because they talked about an era early on in which many people shared one computer. And then in the future, many computers would share each of us. And now that we're in that era, what they wrote about started to come true. They also talked about invisible technology. And, and a lot of people, especially in advertising, think about invisible technology as it's there and it's doing things on your behalf and you don't see it. But, but the quote that I really like is that a good tool is an invisible tool, 
by invisible, it's not that the tool is actually invisible. It just means that it doesn't intrude on our consciousness. You focus on the task and not the tool. So think about when you use a hammer, you're not focusing on the hammer, you're focusing on the nail. Your consciousness is actually passing through the hammer and that's, that's the most important thing about a tool is that you're focusing on the task. It's a pass through thing. It's extending your human capability. I ended up writing a book on calm technology because no one had really written a large uh, anything about this. And Mark Weiser died early and he wasn't even around to see the future he predicted. But I think the most important thing that he said is that in the future, it's not that technology will be scarce. Technology will be everywhere. The most scarce thing in the future will be our attention and how technology works with or against our attention will make or break that technology. Uh, since this book has been published, uh, there has been a little bit of an industry change. Um, a lot of people have realized that there are washers and dryers that are really loud and designed for suburban homes where you need to hear it through the basement. Um, they've allowed you to turn the alarms off or change the alarm state. Um, I was, uh, I got hired by Microsoft to work with them on some of their uh, principles of design that were influenced by Calm Technology. Uh, there's an entire startup that got created on Calm Technology in Japan, um, which is called MUI. Uh, there's been uh, a bit of the humane technology efforts that have happened and a lot of design alternatives to Silicon Valley. So there's actually been uh, quite a few companies influenced by this, and I'm just glad to pass the message from the 80s and 90s to today uh, where the message was intended. So how do we actually design calm technology? What does it mean to design something that's calm? Well, the first tenant that Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown out, um, outlined was that technology shouldn't require all of our attention, just some of it and only when necessary. And this is super important because we think about how much resolution is in front of our eyes and, and how much technology requires our full attention and eyesight. When in reality, some technology simply like a street light can require some of our attention in our peripheral attention. We don't have this high resolution right in front of us, but we have a lot of attention capability just through hearing, just through uh, seeing behind you, uh, just through understanding a light or a small buzz or just something like a buzz on your hand. Like there are all of these other ways that we can alert people. And so if we just focus on the visual, we're missing out on this whole sensory landscape that humans have evolved with. And so when we focus on some of that information being put in your peripheral attention in the periphery, we end up opening so much more into keeping you in a state of flow while also delivering you information. Just take a light switch, for example. If, if a five-year-old can reach it, they can even use a light switch. Anyone can use a light switch. It is pretty universal. And with the light switch, you don't have to look at it to turn it on or off. You can kind of tap the wall in the dark and find it. Um, people can come home at, at three in the morning and find the light switch. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. And the technology behind it is quite invisible and also re regarded as dangerous, it's electricity. And this doesn't go out very often. It's a big deal if it goes out, uh, but most of the time it's just there and we trust uh, an electrician to go in and actually upgrade it and fix it. But the idea is that it's meant to be there for a really long time and be incredibly stable. And it's right there when you need it and you don't notice it on the wall when you don't. It's not shouting at you saying, hey, you've left the light on for some time. Would you like to turn it off now in a disembodied human voice? If we were to design light switches like we're designing technology right now, it would be kind of a mess. It would be very hard to turn on and off the lights or you would have to go into your phone um, and get distracted by work emails just to turn them on and off, except for the switch. So this idea of technology should be able to deliver you information and calm you at the same time is really important. And, um, and that can be done if you empower your peripheral attention. So this is a, this is a simple, you know, if you do have a smart light, um, uh, my old co-founder Aaron Parecki created this uh, system where this is just a hue light bulb, a smart light bulb, but it's connected to a weather report. So this was in our kitchen. And um, what it would do, it, was, it would just change color based on what the weather would be for the day. 
So it's not in your bedroom, you know, by the time you get out into your kitchen in the morning, like you have a little bit more consciousness. Um, and what it would do is this, this is showing just a yellow um, because it was going to be sunny that day. A lot of times it showed blue because I live in Portland, it's very rainy. Um, but this idea of changing the information that would normally be on a small dashboard, which you can kind of see uh, on the iPad there on the wall, but you can change that, uh, which takes a lot of attention to look at into a simple color. And then, and this is called info synesthesia, changing information into a different sense. And in doing so, you can walk into a room and feel the data in the room instead of having to look at the dashboard in order to understand the data. If you want more information, you can always look at the dashboard, but this is a low resolution information that you can feel first, a kind of ambient information uh, before you then get more information and get that, that, that greater granularity. This is also an idea of, of seeing temperature. Another example of infosynesthesia is this um, idea of a heat sink. So it's just a simple sensor that you can screw onto your faucet and there's an LED in it and it changes color based on the temperature. It's really straightforward. And in fact, it's kind of like mundane looking, um, but imagine um, being able to understand like your shower temperature is a particular color of purple that you like and being able to understand uh, whether it's hot or cold, um, teaching kids about temperature in this way, knowing not to touch it when it's really, really bright red. Um, this sort of thing where you can, you can see and understand something before you even touch it is a really interesting way of embedding information into your landscape in a calm, ambient way. Technology should be amplifying the best of what technology can do and the best of what humanity can do. Uh, a lot of people try to make machines that act like humans. And I always ask like, why are you trying to do that? We don't expect a dog to act like a human. It's a companion species. It, it has its own benefits and deficits, but fundamentally it's different than us. In the same way, when we try to have technology act like a human, you know, that's where you end up like having humans act like their machines. When you have an automated phone system and you're trying to be on hold and there's a robot with you, all you're doing is pressing zero or one, just trying to get to a human. When it's that important, it needs to be a real person. Um, and humans shouldn't be acting like machines. We, we shouldn't be doing tasks that might be better automated by a machine or we should do tasks that, that have meaning and depth to us. Um, so when we think about things like machine learning and AI, it's its own kind of species. It's, it's a companion species to humans. It is influenced by humans. But if we work with what that is really good at and what we're really good at and have something that works alongside us, we get rid of a lot of these fears of, of automation and when people get trapped, when a system thinks it knows better than them. There's, there's so much science fiction that's been written about this, especially in the 80s. Um, and we seem to have forgotten some of it. And we keep thinking about how um, technology could be in, in some ways like more human than us for some reason. If we think about human universals, no matter what, uh, all humans really need these things in particular. Well, the first is belonging. Like humans want to belong to something, whether that's a group or a tribe, whether that's a nationality or uh, somebody who likes bacon, for instance. Um, but they want to belong and they want to feel a sense of connection. And in doing so, they also want to feel safe. Like we build houses, we have insurance, like we want to feel safe, we want to feel protected. And we want to have a kind of sense of ease Sometimes when the ease is too much, like having a, an escalator on the way to a gym, a lot of people will take the escalator. We often choose ease before we choose the hard things. Um, but we also don't want to deal with, you know, five minutes of loading time when we're trying to file our taxes online. We want to have ease into some of the harder systems that we have to, to, to interact with. And then finally, not all the time, but we would also like to have this sense of awe like the idea about learning astronomy for the first time or, or coming up with the, the idea of a unicorn or, or any of these fantasy books that we read as kids and, 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 and take into our, our adulthoods. And finally, if we have too much of the same thing in our lives, uh, we feel dull. And I think everything in nature is full of variety and, and awe and, and so much, and we need that in our lives instead of the, the same sound, for instance, over and over again. 
So when we look at Google, Google has a really good balance of the idea of doing things that uh, humans are good at and doing things that machines are good at. We don't think about Google all the time as like a pass through interface, but when Google first came out, people tried to scroll down the page. They didn't understand it as a regular web page. Most of the web pages that they went to were there's information, scroll down. So when Google happened, it was you add yourself, you add your idea to Google. And in doing so, it gives you a list of things. And you are allowed as a human to pick from that list. The, the I'm feeling lucky button that used to be on there was actually removed. It, it didn't really get the idea for you all the time. If we ask, if we ask the machine to choose, we lose, uh, we lose some control. And, we, and, and the idea is that the machine might be able to get us 70 or 80% there, or sometimes 90% there. Um, but it's our relationship with that machine and our end choice as the curator instead of the, you know, the, the, the thing that can go through 10 million pages in, in a half a second. Um, it gives us that, that reduced list, but then we're the one making the, the, the decision. And so this becomes this relationship working alongside technology, using technology as a tool instead of technology using us or us having to maintain this tool um, that's really frustrating. So this idea of humans alongside technology is not new. This is, this is how we originally used our tools. And I would argue that tools and technology are not separate. Uh, when we get really arrested by technology, it's usually because of the media on the technology that it's delivering. The shape of the media is causing our behavior. Um, but if we look at some examples of humans alongside technology, um, this is an example of an exoskeleton used in Japan um, this person had an injury and was older and wanted to go back to work. So he has this small purple and green exoskeleton and it just helps him lift boxes a little bit easier. This is an assistive technology and it's super, it, it doesn't look like Terminator or Robocop. It looks like two purple lungs and like a little bit of, of like harmoniously colored information. Um, and it's really straightforward. All it does is just help a little bit. And you can see from the outside whether the battery is going to go out or anything like that. But it's it designed exactly for what it needs to be. Um, and I love this piece of technology because it doesn't look really scary. Um, it's just something that helps you out. And it doesn't make the person wearing it look too weird. It's just something that that's helping them out with. So I really like this idea of, of assisted technology. Um, this is another example uh, this is um, a ceramics manufacturing, <laughs> uh, but this is from, you know, this is, this is hundreds of years old. This is a technology that just uses the power of the river to grind up clay and, and make it very fine. And then this is used in, in pottery that's been in a village, I think, for at least 400 years. Um, but this idea of using the river alongside uh, this technology um, is just very brilliant. So here is something working outside of you, doing an automation for your village. It's the river working alongside you to work with you. There's an idea in Japan. I spent, I spent a couple of years studying Japan and Japanese automation, mostly because whenever I go over there, the automation seems so much smoother than it does in the States. Um, the Calm Technology book that I wrote is also translated into Japanese, uh, which, which has been fun to go over there and, and learn more. But there's this concept from uh, the Japanese tea ceremony called omotenashi. And omotenashi is really about the idea of the host anticipating what you will need and being there for you uh, with that object or, or process when you need it. And this is not to say that technology should always assume what you're going to do and have it there for you next. If it has it there for you next, then allow the user to choose. Um, but I'll give you an example of something that I found very endearing and also helpful. When you're in Japan as a tourist, it can be very difficult to buy a ticket to the machine. And here is this guy who had trouble. Um, literally, somebody finds that he's having trouble and a real person comes out of the wall and helps him. And I find this incredible for a number of reasons. One is that we assume that things will, there's an assumption that things will go wrong at some point. And the technology is the human backup to help with that machine. That you can automate the machine all you want, but at some point it will break down 
And the best thing that a human can have is a human backup, is a warm embrace. Think about the shoe company Zappos. Zappos realized that, of course, people don't want to buy shoes online. They're going to not have a good time. They, they won't fit most of the time. So what they said is, in order for people to buy shoes online, we have to embrace the fact that they will fail much of the time. And we have to make that process of failure so wonderful and so smooth that they will not hesitate to order six or seven pairs of shoes, try them on, and then have a wonderful time sending them back. This made Zappos a really successful company because there was an anticipation of failure and making that failure point delightful. How many times in the technology that we build today do we anticipate failure and make it really easy to come back from it and, and not cause somebody to think in their own head that they did the wrong thing? So technology can communicate, but it doesn't need to speak. In, in some of these slides, I've, I've shown how you can speak differently through technology, not just having a disembodied human voice or a display, but simply through having a, a simple light color that changes. The Roomba robotic vacuum cleaner, at least the early one, was really great because it would go around the floor and there would be a simple light that was green, whether it was okay, and red when it was not. And it also had a cute tone that would go da 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 when it was done, like it was an excited, happy robot, um, or dun dun, like when it was stuck. And so when it was stuck, you would know and you could go help it out. It didn't try to do everything for you. And because you helped it out as a human, these objects started to become very endearing to people. Uh, cats even rode around on them in YouTube videos and people still have them in their homes today. But the design of this robot didn't have a disembodied voice that said, your floor is clean. <laughs> that would not make a lot of sense and be annoying to hear every single day. But also it's not in the shape of a robot pushing a vacuum. It is like a filter feeder or like a trilobite um, or, or one of those, those filter feeder fish in a fish tank. It is the exact shape and size to do the task and nothing more. And I think of this as kind of a, a, a triumph of design because it's everything that's needed and nothing that's not needed. And more importantly, when, if you remember the Tamagotchi, the, the pocket pet that came out and it was all the craze, there was this little pet that you would have and you would have to feed it. It required your attention. You had to feed it, you had to care for it. Here was this piece of technology that wasn't doing everything for you. Suddenly it was kind of helpless and you had to make sure that it was okay. The room is kind of like that. It's not perfect. And when it kind of stumbles around, it becomes adorable and you want to help it. Humans want to help care for things. And so having a technology that you have to care for a little bit, uh, that's not doing everything for you and becomes kind of adorable, ends up being something that's endearing and, and can go into our lives more, even though it seems a little bit, um, a little bit contradictive because in a lot of our science fiction films, it's all about you know these things that are smarter than us and do all these things for us. But we have to understand the difference between science fiction and our, and our real life in our real life, we don't wanna to have to notice our light switch and have it talk to us all the time. We, we want to have a, a robotic vacuum cleaner, but we don't want it to look like Terminator. Um, we actually want really mundane, boring things in our lives um, so that we can just use them and not notice them every time. The novelty wears off really quickly, but looks really cool in films. And so we have to kind of leave the novelty in the film separate from our everyday life which is pretty hard to do because it's so exciting to think about how we should be building technology and have it be really, really great. But the most successful technology like a sink, a toilet, a washing machine, a dryer, a car, they're all very, very mundane. And they also allow you to use them without noticing too much. Like the, the vehicle has a foot pedal, which we, we used to have on sewing machines. We used to have uh, mostly on trash cans. There were a lot of foot pedal technologies. And in fact, the very first mouse had a foot pedal to help you scroll down the page. Um, we've lost one of our limbs in, in interacting with technology by removing the foot pedal. Um, so, it's, so sometimes it's really important to like look back at the past and say, what did we use that we're missing now that allowed us to have um, more attention spread elsewhere um, in our periphery? Uh, technology should work when it fails. Uh, when an escalator fails, uh, it turns into stairs. You can still use it. Uh, when some of our technology, you know, when you put your airplane mode on your phone, uh, a lot of it will just not work at all. There is a really disturbing trend that's happening right now that I'm really upset about, which is 
If you are not connected to the web, you cannot use the Adobe suite. Uh, you can't use Photoshop or Lightroom or any of these things. You need to have an internet connection to validate that you own the software, even if you've been using it every day. Um, apps that are really useful for business like Notion. Uh, Notion now, like if you, if you don't have Wi-Fi access, you can't use it. There are all of these things that require that and don't have offline support. And so as we get more and more re reliant on the cloud, uh, if the cloud breaks or we lose that connection, we don't actually own our information. So this, this new development, <clears throat> when we used to have mainframes, we had uh, all the technology, all of the information near us. Um, and then uh, now we're storing so many things in the cloud. When we had desktop computers, we did not think of that. We didn't think that we'd be storing all of our personal data in the cloud. So I think the new movement after this is going to be a, a decentralization that we want some of our personal data back with us. Imagine going to the doctor and having your medical records and your personal data file that you would share with them during the appointment for the treatment of your disease. And then all new information would then be stored in your data file with you. That this kind of data sovereignty becomes so important, especially if it becomes really, really expensive to get to the cloud um, and, and expensive to maintain um, all of that there. And the fact that it's just so exciting for hackers to come in um, and, and, and such a data lake. So if you only shared information with the party that you wanted to for the temporary amount of time during that relationship, then if a hacker wanted to hack, they would only get what was shared with that entity for the last 24 hours. It would be on your device with you and a lot more secure. So I hope we're moving a little bit more towards that future since we've become so cloud-based um, because it's pretty easy to, think, to put things in the cloud but it's becoming more and more expensive to get them out. This is hard to do, but in any software, hardware, interface, in any design, the right amount of technology is the minimum to solve the problem. You have to do a lot of customer research in order to figure out what the core problem is and what the problem is just at all. But if you can, and you take away things until there's nothing left to take away and you just have that core problem, that's where we, we look at these very scalable companies, like just like Airbnb. It's like, I have an extra room in my house. What can I do? And the interface in that, at that exchange becomes this almost invisible layer that connects people to each other and is more of a pass through technology to just show people, here's a place that you can book. Um, but the right amount uh, being the minimum, like literally the, the technology that you use every day if you drive is the street light. It's a really simple color. It tells you red or green. Even if you're red or green colorblind, you can still understand where it is. Um, but it's so simple. It's like punctuation. If we were to build these lights like we do today, uh, we would have some sort of like countdown in our cars and then we'd be looking at our phone until it said go. Um, but it's more important that it's, it's something that we use every day that we don't notice. And I would encourage you to think about all the things that you don't notice that you just smoothly use, those are really, really good technologies that don't have anything extra in them, like a stop sign um, or this toilet occupied sign. Again, it's really, really simple, but consider that the icons for this came from the Bauhaus movement over hundred years ago and that those icons are almost universal. They might be a little bit outdated, but they are very, very universal in that you can go to almost any country and understand where the bathrooms are. And this is really working with human universals and understanding. These are these, these simple icons that you can just put a light behind them. Again, even if you're red, green, colorblind, you can tell whether the toilet is occupied or not, or just a little handle that like changes them to occupied or not. And it's just red or green. It doesn't need a special interface. It doesn't need any connection, uh, but it gets the point across ambiently. So if good design allows people to accomplish their goals in the least amount of moves, and it's your job as a designer to, to remove the moves as much as you can without infantilizing the user, making sure that they have agency. Um, then calm technology allows you to accomplish those goals, but with the least amount of mental cost. And that's so crucial um, because a person's primary task, unless you want to be a computer and unless you wanna be a system administrator in your own home, which some people do, um, but a person's task is really not about being computing, being a computer or computing, but being human. When we think about our lives and we're on our deathbeds, 
we don't not think about the time that we did the Apple TV update um, before we watched our favorite show. We think about the sunset that we watched or the time that we spent with loved ones and how little time we spent with them because we were doing something else. And I encourage all of you, you know, keep your phone in airplane mode sometimes so that you can understand the world around you <clears throat> and be with the loved ones um, when you can. So again, this quote from Mike Weiser that I love that the scarce resource is no longer technology. Today, our scarcest resource is attention and we can design better systems and tools to work alongside us instead of for us and to give us more agency and to allow us to be more in depth, smarter humans, not smarter technology. If you wanna learn more about Calm Technology, I made a website that um, archives a lot of their research before it goes away. It's at calmtech.com and you can read the book too, um, which is, I intended it to be quite short so you could get through it on a simple plane trip. So thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, your time today and it's great to be here. Thank you very much, Amber. So we have some questions already. Um, first one, uh, John asks, is Calm Technology making any inroads into the hospital space? Alarm fatigue is a major problem in ICUs. Everything is always beeping or screeching, so nurses eventually just tune most of it out. This is a super important topic. Actually, after writing this book, I realized just how bad um, alert fatigue was in hospitals. And you're right. A new nurse will get to an alarm in within seven minutes. A veteran nurse, as in a nurse that's been around for one or two years, will get to that alarm in an average of 40 minutes. Um, there will be thousands to 10,000s alerts uh, every day and it just gets really annoying. And just like when your alarm clock goes off and you don't wanna see it, you just, you just um, silence the alert. There's a lot of false alarms too, because of regulation, you have to have the alarm go off a lot. And a lot of them are in the same frequency. And so it's a frequency that you can then tune out. They're required to be in specific frequencies um, because of originally how the chips were built. Um, a really small chip can't do a lower frequency tone because it's it's more expensive to have a more more lower frequency tone. And so that's why we have the really sharp alerts at a very high frequency and they all sound kind of the same and there's a bunch of false alarms. So I got really upset about this and I wrote a whole other book on it called Designing with Sound, um, which has a bit of a chapter on trying to work with alert fatigue. Um, my dad died pretty early and I would visit him in the hospital and watch as the doctors and nurses did not get to the alarms on time and he was in pain. Um, it is a really, really hard thing to solve, mostly because of those regulations around alarm frequency and the false alarms. So mostly the alarm system, uh, which is not one system, it's like every single company on the planet, um, yeah. you know, it, it would take some regulatory um, uh, ideas <laughs> and it would take quite a bit of time to, to change these things. And I'm thinking more like, you know, when, when Nest came in and changed the thermostat, like there has to be a bit of, of special design understanding. Um, maybe, maybe some ex Apple people that can say, how do we get this into the right shape where it's going to be okay. Um, and you'll also catch those false alerts and we can work around the regulation that says that it has to go in this frequency or we can have something that um, does not play the same tune every time, but plays something like a little bit nicer. It's, it's a little hard to take like a beautiful violin sound and put it onto a really low quality chip. It, it sounds just like a really bad hotline when you're on hold, when they play classical music. Don't play classical music, play the Cisco hold music. That is an electronic music song that comes across really clear in voice compression technology. Um, and so just understanding the nature of what you can do on the chip and then possibly putting some, some sort of granularity or randomness into it um, could allow people to have those unique tones in their head or just having that change to some colors. So imagine a nurse coming in and looking at the colors and knowing which machine was going to be okay or not um, as, as a kind of secondary alert or even having a light outside of the hospital room that has a specific color that you can tell whether it needs to be checked on. So at a glance, you can say, what do I need to check on? Oh, that, right? So there's a lot of things that can be done outside of the regulations, um, but it has to be change it into a different sense, change it into like a slight variation on this tone, 
try to make a sound at that really annoying child screaming frequency um, that, that's going to sound a little bit easier within the chip limitations. So that's a really, really good question. Um, I've, I've tried to work on it very hard, um, but it would take you know a, another 10 years of my life to try to even solve that simply because um, of, of that difficulty. So maybe try in another country um, or, or, or work with um, Dyson or something like that um, to do it. So thank you for that great question. Yeah, and there's a good thread in that one with uh, Pam Selly and some others uh, talking about things like, you know, SRE space is talking about monitoring issues, Monitorama as a conference that she references, so. Oh, great, yeah, yeah. It's, it's you know, my favorite um, kind of monitoring situation. So I had a little startup and we found this, this little server farm that had like really great uptime. And we went in and we said, can we have a tour of the server farm? And the person said, yeah, sure, yeah, okay. So we go in and we go into this, like, it's this guy that hunts ducks and he's like in his seventies and he's just got like vintage furniture and wood paneling. And it looks like it's in the forties or like, <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's just, and he's got his old like hound dog sitting mm -hmm. there on, on the, the green carpet. And we're like, is this the server facility? And he said, yeah. He said, yeah, I, I'm the server manager. And I said, well, where are the servers? And he said, oh, uh, they're behind this door. And he opens up this door and it's, you know, it's the matrix back there. It's like, wow, well, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and so we, we go and we say, well, we're looking for a place for our, our server racks. And we noticed that there were lights on all of the machines. And then there were kind of secondary lights. And he said, look, I barely go into this server room because I don't need to. I've automated each process out and then put them into a very small panel inside my office and he took us back into the, the, the wood paneled office and there was like just a little square on the wall and it had red green and blue or red green and yellow lights and that's it and so uh he would say look most of the time it's green but if it's yellow then i can go into the server facility and look for the machine that says yellow and go and fix it and he says that happens maybe once a month <laughs> and then wow. you know and then if it's red, like I just never let it get to red. So we have like 99.97% .97 uptime or something absolutely ridiculous um, because he sits there thinking, he says, I'm sitting here in my office, you know, reading my bird magazines, but I'm also thinking about what's that thing that gave me grief that I can automate so that I don't have to deal with it. And so it's just this person thinking, you know, we, we think about you know, you, you have these kind of um, Wall Street savants that sit there and think in a basement and then do these great trades that outperform all the robots. There are every once in a while, these amazing individuals. It's like, if you, if you took that guy out of there and you said, we will make sure that you can duck hunt for the rest of your life, just let us, you know, work with you on your process for, for automating your attention, um, it would be fantastic. He was just so calm and the only guy working there <laughs> and just really relaxed about this and and everybody wanted to to host uh their service with him um, what a perfect so. example of calm technology right yeah absolutely um we have another one here let's see uh this is just a funny uh thing i thought was hilarious um john flinchbong i believe uh my roomba when i first got it got stuck and yelled for help in japanese need to figure out how to change the language <laughs> that's always a challenge right if you set the language wrong to something and then it's no longer calm technology it's confusing that, technology. yes this is such a great example so uh when ruma came out it just had the da da da, da or dun dun um but then they're like let's internationalize it and i was like you don't need to the da da da, da and dun dun is almost universal across every single language why would you now you've got to hire a higher translator now you have to have more room on the storage to store all the different translations. It's not necessary. You know that it's done with a positive sound. And so the more recent uh, the updates, the Roomba have gotten it all wrong. Like translate the user guide into a different language. It's a piece of paper, but don't translate the actual thing because it's universal. It should, you know, just like a Pixar film does so well, uh, like the little intro to the Pixar film is also always like this thing without any language like we don't need to have a human language in our machines because the minute we do we expect to, to be able to interact with those machines like we would as a human and that gets us into a bad user experience um i'm so sorry they're doing that uh that is a really funny story and i wish they would just keep it dun 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 dun, dun, dun and then we would be fine <laughs> great great example 
Here's another one. Um, Amber, oh, this is a Daniel Maladinoff asked this. Amber, aren't the goals of com technology antithetical to the goals of most current apps and services? I put current in there, like increasing engagement and or extracting the maximum amount of data from the product crossed out user. In other words, where's the money in com technology? And I think of like, there's a Breathe app, right? For the iPhone, you install it. I've had it in my phone. I keep forgetting <laughs> I install it. And every once in a while, when in the middle of 15 other things, it goes, you need to take some time to breathe. I'm like, I'm busy. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Those are bad. Kind of thoughts. Those yeah. do not work. Yeah. Okay. So it's a great question. Um, first off, if you have a monopoly like Microsoft, <laughs> um, you uh, what they've determined is that there's 21 million Americans that have some sort of, of difference, uh, like in terms of temporary, permanent, or uh, relational. So like, for instance, like you might be blind some of the time because of the sun, or you might be in a restaurant and it's really loud and you can't hear, or you might be deaf or you might, you know, um, or it might be a temporary thing while you heal, but you still need to be able to use the technology when you're in all of those different states. And so th what they've created as is an inclusive uh, card deck where you can actually test your technology against all of these use cases. When we talk about, you know, just an app that's, that's making money off of you, we forget that Google, uh, what, while it has ads, those are pretty calm and that that is a, a huge billion dollar company um, Amazon is actually built on the principles of Calm Technology. Um, John Seeley Brown was on their board for almost two decades. Uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, the idea behind it is Calm Technology. Working with it, it's not very calm. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, so Amazon is built on Calm Tech, by the way. Uh, your shopping experience is meant to be calm. You don't even notice you loading stuff into your cart. Uh, Google definitely works on Calm Tech. They even they even used some of the Calm Tech principles for some of their, their like healthy guidelines uh, recently. Um, some of these other systems and interfaces, we won't see them around. Uh, you know, they they don't last a super long time. Apple is based on the ideas of Calm Technology because it came out of Xerox Park um, and and Alan Kay and the Dyna Book 1968. Like these ideas are showing up in industry. And they are in the big things that you don't think about. The, the interface in the media in an Apple phone is not calm, but Apple itself, the device is calm. So it's kind of an interesting thing because there's a lot of people taking our short-term attention and turning this into products. Um, and those are extremely unhealthy, but those are definitely not based on calm tech. And I guarantee you that some of the companies that, that work on these, like Dyson made the quiet hair dryer. Uh, they spent like four years researching that. It's a huge product because now they're using it in their vacuums. If you take something that hasn't been innovated in a long time, like a hair, dry, a hair dryer or a vacuum, and you innovate that for the vector of what's the annoying thing? It's the noise. Let's reduce the noise and make it calm. You end up with billion dollar companies. And so there's, there's so much money to be made in calm. And in the most stereotypical version of calm, um, there's like these mindfulness apps that are out there that, that, that make millions and millions of dollars uh, that teach you to be mindful and meditation, not stop you over 15 minutes and tell you to take a drink. Like that's, you know, when you choose to use them, um, they're, they're interacting with you. And then just the, the washer and the dryer industry, the fridge industry, the faucet industry, um, door locks, all of these are calm technologies, they're tools. Those are also billion dollar industries that we don't think about because they aren't as shiny and we don't have a bunch of conferences about them and there aren't TechCrunch articles on how they violated our privacy. Uh, so actually there's lots more to be made in, in, in Calm and getting you into those kind of arrested mental states is using some Calm tech, unfortunately, to get you in there um, so that you'll, you'll stay on site longer um, to get you into that state of flow. But yeah, there's 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 a lot. Um, it's just it's hard for us to um, to separate that out because we think of technology as kind of in your face when in reality most of our lives are mitigated by technology and we barely notice it. Um, so really good question. Thank you. Okay, we have another one. Um, it seems like appliances. So this is kind of similar in a similar vein, you know, yeah, about yeah. appliances being uh, being annoyingly smart. Um, and, you know, trying to find a way to get people to vote with their dollars to, to better, more calm systems. Um, it, it, can you think of any other ways to maybe accelerate this movement towards calmer tech? Like, are there other reviews or websites or people that are looking at things constantly? I know you are. Um, like, where are some places you would look for better calm technologies? 
Yeah, so especially with the sound rating, there are now some sound rating like logos that you can see on things. And so um, especially for like fans, um, air, air purifiers and filters, they will have like a decibel rating, uh, which is which has come up more recently, which is great, which is like you want your decibel rating to be, you know, under 70 decibels for it to, to you know, be a little bit quieter than a human conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also definitely taking over the more industrial space right now. And, you know, what happens to industry like happens, happens to humans later. But um, my favorite example is the blend tech blender. So blend tech blender is a thousand dollar blender. But if you think of Jamba Juice and all these blendy things in a mall with no acoustic treatment around it and all these kids that are trying to hear you and you trying to, to say what your blend tech is like before you would just hear, you know, your Jamba Juice would just be like a din of awful noise. And so the blend tech actually designed containerization that would that would keep the sound waves inside um, and then would um, be very quiet. And now you can use a blend tech in the middle of you know a busy mall uh, without having to go in the back right in front of the customer and blend techs are doing very very well so a lot of people are caring more about noise and they're also caring more and more about noise like in cities uh, we do not have uh, ways to like say hey this diesel truck needs to be quieter right um, new york is is you know it's been proven that all this ambient noise is bad for your health but we do have, you know, Bose noise counseling headphones and things that people are using more and more. Um, so it's it's showing up. It just it takes a while because there's still an industry that's invested a lot of money into devices that were made poorly and they have huge marketing budgets. And until they kind of run out of that marketing budget and we get annoyed and we replace something with something else, um, we just kind of have to wait. But but in the meantime, I do see like the sound score on a lot of these washers and dryers. Um, and a lot of people are buying South Korean devices, not necessarily because they're quieter, but because they're more delightful. Like there's a, a Samsung washer and dryer that I had, and it has a little tune that, that goes off. Yep, um, I have that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I'm going to buy this one. Uh, it's high tech, sure, but it's really high tech in the ways that I want it. I have all these settings that are really easy to use. Um, I remember when I was growing up, my friend, my mom and dad had a lot of friends from Japan, and we ended up having this like Zarushi rice cooker. And it made this cute song when it was done. And as a kid, I would run and tell my mom, the rice is done. Like, we can eat rice. Yeah. <laughs> like, and we would go and get the rice. Um, so I think some countries are learning more and more about this. And the more we kind of uh, take our inspiration from nature and ideally, you know, Japan, <laughs> who's, who's figured this out for a long time, we'll, we'll have better technology. Um, even just like the automatic, automatic sliding door is a piece of calm technology that's really popular um, and definitely all over Japan um, because you used to have these sliding doors. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's showing up in unexpected places, but it's never going to be this like, it's the new trend to do calm tech because then it would mean that it would not be the trend to do calm tech. Like this, this is like a 50 year uh, thing <laughs> that, I, that I hope will be a slow burn. So thank you so much for your question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Ark Arch image or Arch Archimage. I'm not sure how to say that. I, I follow him on Twitter. It's great. Um, okay, there's a couple other things in here. Uh, someone mentioned a book. Uh, Stephen Edwards says, I'm reminded of a great book that touches on many of the themes you presented on. It's The World Beyond Your Head by Matthew Crawford. Highly recommended. Oh, awesome. Check um, that one out. Yeah. Someone um, also posted a video. Um, there's another question here too, which has some back and forth. Scott Nickel and Pam Sally again. Uh, to what extent is a smartphone a crutch for product developers? It's easy to put functionality in the phone app while keeping the product almost brick-like rather than having some control notification native to the product. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, so I had an argument with uh, a, a large uh, smart speaker company, which I cannot name. Uh, they had this kind of product designer that had just graduated from Stanford and he was, he was just like, they were like, look, we have, you know, if you think about the things that haven't been taken away on this phone, like you have the on off switch for your, for the sound. Um, and this connected speaker company was saying, well, we're going to go like Steve Jobs and we're going to remove all the buttons uh, so that you don't have control anymore. And 
and because it's easier to manufacture. And I said, oh, and what button are you removing? And they said, well, we're going to remove the volume button for this connected speaker technology. <laughs> That's a really bad idea. <laughs> I know. And I stood up in the middle of the meeting and I started yelling at him and I, I, I couldn't help it. And I felt bad, but I was also like, everybody in this room knows that this is a bad idea, right? Like, let's say you're coming home and it's been a really busy week at work and you're having a nice date night and you have the lights turned, you know, you want to turn the lights down low and you want to change the music. Oh, you have to go to your phone and then you're going to see your work email or, you know, you yeah. can't just tap the side. And what happens if, you know, your kid turns it up really, really far because they got Bluetooth access to the speaker and you can't turn it down. All you have to do is like unplug it. You know, it's, it's these things of, we have these kind of cults of personalities where we're like, oh, let's take everything away. It's like, no, it's not take everything away. The things that you take away is really important. Um, and the volume button, no matter what in any era is super crucial. Like we need to be able to control volume with a physical button. Um, that's also why on the new Macs where they have that intelligent bar and you can't turn down the volume, uh, it really freaks me out, which is why like, I still have these Bose headphones with like a, a physical control button because sometimes that, that load, that volume button takes a while to load on my computer, you know? So it's, yeah. it's this thing of, you know, it just takes, um, we'll have some mistakes and it'll be kind of a mess. Um, and, but what I think the, the bad trend is that, you know, if you were a woodworker in the past or you took wood, wood shop in school or home ec, like two really crucial classes for having depth of understanding of tools and humans, um, then, then, you, then you get rid of that depth of like, you end up living in a little condo, having Uber Eats and not knowing how to fix anything. And, and that's not what we should be living in as humans. We should be able to have enough depth to control and solve the things that we have. Um, and I think we'll see that coming back a little bit because things always oscillate and we're in like the most automated infantilized stage ever. Um, but that can't last forever. Um, and there's a lot of people that are kind of railing against it. I mean, that was where hipster culture came from, but um, you know, this, <laughs> it's important, right? So um, it's, it's also important to just make sure that in this era that you have a hobby that, that is analog and requires a lot of, of depth or not analogs, like sewing is not analog. You're working alongside a machine and an automation, but there's a, a harmony between that. And it takes a while to learn. It doesn't mean, I think there's an idea that technology should be easy to use. A car is not easy to use, but once you get over the learning curve, it's incredibly powerful and almost effortless that you, you, can, you can do it automatically. So focusing more on those kind of systems um, is going to be important. Thank you for your question. So I think I'm, I'm going to wrap it up here. There's a lot of other questions, but I'm thinking if you, if you were able to stay on, on Slack for a little bit and go to the keynote channel, if you're up for that, there are a couple other people that you might want to engage with. So up to you, but that might be good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll have to grab that invite to the Slack channel. I'll send it over to you. Okay, great. Great. Well, again, Amber Case, thank you so much for joining us as our keynoter for day two. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, take care.